Yama guys, my name is Josh Staines. I'm a Rajari Nunga man from down Molonga Parks. Ginnigay guys, my name is Zoe and I'm a very proud Bunjalung woman from northern New South Wales. Welcome to episode five. This week's recipe, we have spaghetti. Josh, what do you put on your spaghetti? I uh, put a little bit of minced meat, some tomatoes, onions, and pasta. That's about it. Well, this week we have decided to add some veggies to make that spaghetti, the traditional spaghetti, that much more delicious and that much more healthy. Check it out. So today we're looking at a spaghetti bolognese. Everyone's got their own recipe, a family recipe, and everyone swears by their own. Today we're just going to show you how to use a few more veggies, um, reduce the salt, and just have a little bit more flavour in there. Now okay, we're going to start with chopping up just some onion. You can use either the red Spanish onion or brown. Just dice it up as small as I can to blend it in a little bit more. the garlic, same thing as the onion, try to dice it up as small as you can. You can use a crusher, um, which will make your job a lot easier. So today we're going to use capsicum, carrot, zucchini and some extra tomatoes to flavour this. There's a couple of ways you can prepare your vegetables. I'm just going to dice them today to leave them a bit more chunky. But usually with kids, if you grate them up, it'll just bulk your sauce and you won't be able to see all the vegetables. Today we just pick some lean beef, mince. Um, other choices are pork, which is quite lean, and or kangaroo. These three meats are quite good. If you're going to cook kangaroo, it needs a little bit more oil because it will dry out. The reason we use olive oil just in the water is to stop the pasta sticking to itself when we drain it. Um, a lot of people put salt in there, but the extra salt is not going to really do anything for the flavour, so there's no need for it. We're going to have plenty of flavour in that sauce. So now we're just waiting for the water to boil before we add our pasta. Let the sauce simmer away. The longer we leave that sauce, the more flavour we'll get in it um, and just taste it. Now that the meat's cooked, it's not too bad to taste. But I usually leave it till the water's boiling, get the pasta in, then taste it, and then if I want some more flavour in it, just add a little bit more mixed herbs in there. So when serving, it's probably important to remember that there's a lot of got vegetables in there to bulk the sauce, so not to put too much onto your pasta, and also not to put too much pasta onto your plate. The extra vegetables do fill you up, so it's best to start small, and if you need seconds, you can always go back for more. Okay, 
perfect. We get asked often what's the best way to start a new life change or how to start an exercise routine. And honestly, our answer is to find the small things in everyday activity. The grand gestures like going to a gym or starting a sport up or returning to a sport that you've been out for a while are good and they give you some good structure. But in honesty, finding those five, 10 minute windows where you can just add extra activity into your everyday is where you get the most gains. A lot of our life now we find we're sedentary. So we're sitting in traffic, we're sitting in our cars, we drive to the shops and home from the shops. We're sitting on our couches. Some good ways that we use are using shopping baskets where you're actually having to carry, where you're using postural muscles and your arms to lug around all the shopping. Obviously, okay, when you're doing the small shops, trying to get off the bus a stop early or two stops early to get that 20 to 100 meters extra walking. A good way and a way most people do know is trying to take the stairs over elevators and escalators and that sort of easy activity. Some of the other recreational activities that our team try to use is the paddling, fishing, spear fishing, swimming, running, riding bikes where it's not always a competition, it's not about how fast we go, but it's just about getting the heart rate pumping a little bit, getting out and having a bit of fun and then spending some time with our families. Basically, we're going to run through a couple of cleanup me methods today. We're going to look at three different bikes. We've got a mountain bike, a standard V-brake system, and a disc brake um, cyclocross. The reason we're going to do this is because different parts need different cleaning, and dirt means different things at different parts of the bike. So, as you can see, it's quite a dirty frame, um, but that's what we're here for. Best thing to do is to get this off straight away after we finish riding. Um, just saves a lot of our componentry. So. The key ones we look at is the frame, dirt all over that, the, basically our chain and our chain rings and cassette at the back, and then just looking at the braking system. The last thing once we're finished is just run an Allen key over our bolts, make sure everything's tight and ready to go for our next ride. So starting with dusting down a frame, a lot of it's going to be superficial stuff, so obviously the dirt all along the solid part of the frames, it's only about look, so the easiest thing to do is get an old t-shirt or rag or a brush and you can just simply sweep it all out. Key little areas we look at is around the bottom here where our fork's drawn into the headset. If we've got dirt or grime in here, you'll feel a little bit of tension or a little bit of grip as you're turning that. So that's one thing we do want to keep nice and clean. One tip we do give, if it's been a wet day, or you've got a lot of mud or a lot of sand sort of stuff, is what we try to do is move our cranks the reverse way just to help get some of that water and crap out. And the other thing we also try to do is swivel our headset so that if any water has gone up that headset or any grime, we can start to work it out. A couple different ways we can do a chain. Um, easiest one I teach people is just grab your rag, wrap it right round, finger tension on the chain and back pedal it. So you start to see a lot of the darkness come off the chain and a lot of the grit. So one thing we can do is just move the individual links and you can feel when they're grimy. So you'll get a little bit of grit in there. Um, one thing you can use is an old toothbrush or a hardest um, brush to get into them. But I usually find just that old rag is good enough to get in there, especially if you do this quite often. So a lot of what we'll see is once we start getting the chain, we'll see a little bit of grip getting back into it and you'll see in the jockey wheels here that there is a lot of grease and build up so what we just try to do is get the rag in there give them a bit of a pinch try not to get your rag through your spokes and then you can just pull it through same on the top jockey wheel so it's easy to reach it from the back here
Okay. Next phase is to clean our cassettes up. Um, best thing to do, like what we did when we changed the tyre, is get that gear right down into your smallest cogs. So right over to the right hand side. This is just going to make it easier for us to put it back in. Skewers come undone. Now what we try to do, one of the tricks, an old t-shirt, where has it got the seam with a thicker part? It's a perfect width for your cassette, so what you can do is stretch it in between the teeth and just move it through. This is the best way to get all that grime and get the darkness off your cassette. So what we do is each tooth, just fit it in, slide it back through. As you can see now, the difference in the colour between the bottom ones we haven't cleaned and the top ones we're starting to scrape off. Next part is uh, on a disc brake, we've got our rotors. Keep them clean. It's just for more for wear and tear and a bit of cosmetics that if they're dirty and grimy, you'll hear them squealing a bit. So what we do, don't use a rag that you've just cleaned with grease. Key to this is to have a nice clean rag the reason why we don't use grease or one with any lube on it is once you put grease or lube on these rotors, it's not going to stick. So when you go to brake next time, it's not going to go. So all you do is just run your fingers over, just give them a little bit of clean up, just make sure there's no grime on the surface. And the last thing you can do, it's a bit of overkill, but you can just get that nice clean long line, put it through those brake rotors and just give them a bit of a dust out. All it means is if there's any sand or grime caught in there, you'll bring it back out. Cool. So when putting your back wheel on, same thing, put it in the small cog that you was in before you took it off. Okay, just check, because we've played around a little bit with the derailleur and uh, a bit of chain, just check your alignment by simply clicking through the gears and pedaling it. And grab the back brake, done. Same process on the front. Undo your skewer. Pop it out. Remember using your clean rag, just give that rotor a bit of a wipe down. And the same thing through that disc. And while you're here, you can clean out that last bit of the fork. With the V-Brake series, um, a lot of road bikes, um, some mountain bikes and some of our kids' bikes will run them, is you've got a braking surface on the outside of the rim. What we try to do, same thing, nice clean rag. Just give that a bit of a dust off, make sure it's clean. Nice surface. Once again, don't lube these surfaces, because if they are lubed, they're not going to grip when you brake. With our V-Brake systems, they're all a little bit different the way they're grooved, but what's important is that groove doesn't have a buildup of um, brake pad dust. So what happens in a wet day, you'll see you'll get a lot more black stuff running up your legs and all over your frame. It's when these are breaking down on that surface, they actually fill these gaps. These ridges give us an idea as well of the wear and tear on the brake pad. So once you've got no more ridges left, you need to get new pads. So it's best just to get a nice clean rag, clean out those grooves, just make sure they're nice and even. When we're talking about evenness, basically you run your finger along. You shouldn't feel any wear and tear that's unnatural. So if you've got the front of the pad being eaten away or the back of the pad, 
or in an angle like a 45 degree angle, we do need to adjust them. So these are pretty good now. So with our mountain bikes, we've just got the shock here. So once again, when we're cleaning a frame down, it's important to get all the moving parts. So best off, try to use a clean rag. It doesn't matter if it's got a bit of lube on it because these can be lubed lightly. Just get in there, dust around and just clean up those washers. What it's important to watch too, is this is uh, with our shocks, it shows you how far that shock is moving. As you can see, this one is right up the top here. So it gives us a gauge that we know that we need to fill that with a little bit more air, depending on which rider we put in there. Um, importance of this is if we know that shock's gonna be bouncing a full load, we're gonna get damaged, so it's a key guide. So just make a note of when you're cleaning them, just where that washer sits. Should usually be about halfway to three quarters. Now that we've got a nice clean bike, one of the things we'll do just before we lube the chain and get it ready for the next ride is a suggestion we try to do for all our riders is grab your Allen keys and go over all your seat post bolts and your headset bolts and just make sure they're nice and tight and they haven't rattled loose. Over the course of a couple of months of riding, you might find that they do come loose a little bit and it's best to find them here rather than when you're out riding. We try to do this most times we ride. Um, for a bike like this, a cyclocross, which will go off-road and on-road, um, it does pick up a lot of dirt and water. For a road bike, you probably get away with it maybe once every fortnight at the least, but you should try to do it weekly. For our mountain bike series, we try to do them after each and every ride. So what we use is just a pro loop. It's just an easy cleaning, uh, self-cleaning lube. What we do, just dribble on the chain, just roll it through. get a good coating. Messy part of the job is just use your fingers now. Just run that chain through your fingers. You can feel the lube going in and you can bend the chain a little bit to make sure you get it in all those links. And then just run it on the outside. Once our chains are lubed, the best thing to do then is just go back through, run that chain all over those cassettes just so you get a little bit of lube over all your teeth. Uh, just gives it a bit of coating and protection until the next ride. That's your basic bike clean. If you do this after each and every ride, you'll limit the amount of mechanicals you have and get the most out of all your gear. So keep it a run. Up next, we have Ani Deb's journey with smoking. So have a look at her interview as she answers some questions about her struggles and how she's so far progressed with that journey. Um, Deborah Linus and I'm a Durham woman um, which is from the La Perouse area and um, yeah, talking to you today about unfortunately that I'm a smoker. <laughs> okay, one of the main reasons I think I, I started smoking, I mean I do come from a family of smokers and I did start very young and unfortunately back then we didn't hear the dangers of smoking like you do now. And um, honestly, we should never started. Um, and yeah, I've been smoking for quite a number of years, uh, let's say 30 plus. <laughs> um, which, as I said, I, honestly, if we had the information that the children and, the, and people have now on what happens when you smoke, I don't know if we would have started. Um, no, not really. I didn't have too many role models or anyone else to um, look at. But as I said, every single member of my family, and where there's nine siblings, um, have all smoked at least sometime in their life. And my father was always a smoker from even when I was a little girl, forever. <laughs> so, um, Mum did smoke for a while, but gave it up. She's a good woman. <laughs> where the rest of us, no, we're pretty bad. Um, okay, fitting of um, cigarettes, I tried several times. I do find that I do actually give up cigarettes um, when I've had my children. 
um, moment I'm pregnant seems to be the first thing I'm quite easy and happy to give up. The moment I have my children, it's one of the first things I take back up again, unfortunately. Um, so I have I have quit for a couple of years for both my children, and then I've tried a few times earlier. The stress is my major factor for taking it back up. Um, for me, unfortunately, I had a car accident just on a year ago, and um, within maybe two hours of the accident, I literally <laughs> grabbed somebody on the street and threw a cigarette, you know, and I found it one of the easiest things to take up. And I do notice if I'm at home getting a bit stressed or worried about work or anything else, um, I tend to smoke more. And more so at home on weekends and things. If I'm worried about stuff, I just, just easier to pick up that packet instead of writing impulsive. You know, my other aim is to write down what I'm stressed about instead, instead of picking up a cigarette and worrying about it while I'm having that signal. So, yeah, stress in part is one of the, is the hardest thing, I think, for most average people that I do know that still smoke. If I ask them why they smoke, it's usually oh, stress related and that's why they pick up that cigarette again. And, um, and I hate it, it shouldn't be like that. We don't need it. I have spoken to Quickline as well. Um, and it was their idea to write down what I was stressed about more so than picking up the cigarette and having that instead and um, that sort of thing. Throwing the packet away and going, that's it, I don't need to smoke anymore. The last time was with Jampix. Um, it was okay. There was the, the, the feeling of feeling a bit ill from that medication. Um, and no, my plans are to throw away that packet again in a week's time. <laughs> smoke at bus stops, can't smoke here, can't smoke there and um, and they do have a very strong quit smoking campaign at my job. <laughs> Big time. There's only, actually only out of 435 council workers, there's only four that smoke. So their campaign's been going for So I do get nagged on my boss. <laughs> and money. Between $60 and $80 a week. Um... Keep adding that up on the 52 weeks, and it starts getting a bit on the <laughs> bit on the hefty side, and that's a holiday, you know. And it's um, something that I don't tend to do very often is go away on holidays. So that's going to be my aim: is to save it all up and, and go out on holiday somewhere. Um, well, my partner gave up smoking two and a half years ago, well, three and a half years ago now, because so I've been smoking again for a year, and um, he's definitely a lot fitter than I am, so, and he's older than I am, so, um, yeah, I'll be him. <laughs> uh, um, no, I do, I do a lot of walking, but, and especially now it's winter, I've noticed that, you know, mornings it's a bit... <coughs> <laughs> and I do wonder, am I getting a cold? No, I shouldn't be because I was, I did have my inoculations for the flu. And it's more like, okay, yeah, I've really got to give it up for my own, my own, really. Because I've got my kids and I've If you take it up, why? When you know what it does to you nowadays. And, and I do, it, it really spins me out on how many young people have decided it must be a real trendy thing to do. And I just, I do, I shake my head and think, give it up now while well, you can, because it's much harder as you get much older. And um, I've been, as I said, smoking for 30 plus years. And, um, you know, I always swore when cigarettes got to a dollar, I'd stop. Now they're 20 bucks, and I still have it, you know. And honestly, where these kids get 20 bucks from every couple of days to buy their own cigarettes is beyond me. And on it, really, what we know on how bad it is for you, why would anyone take it up? As I said, any young person who takes it up now really should think twice before I even like that first one, because it's the first one and it's an easy habit. And unfortunately, it's one of the worst habits, that and drinking, um, that Aboriginal people took up. And um, out of Anything we could have possibly taken up out of any idea, we took up the worst two habits. That's how I feel. It's disgusting habit. And I really, I mean, I'm lucky. Both of my children have chosen not to smoke. Um, 
And if, I think if they told me now, I'd actually look at them and go, why? <laughs> why would you want to start? And, and yeah, so it really does. It spins me out like anyone would want to start when you know what it does. Hi guys, don't forget Koori Cup uh, registrations are now available, so get your registration forms, hand them in, and hopefully we can see you there. Thanks guys for tuning in on Webisode 5. We look forward to having you watch us next week where we're going to be looking at some more activities outside and we're going to be doing another winter warming recipe. Thanks guys. Stay deadly.